Coach Garner here from HockeyTraining.com and in this video I'm going to be breaking down the bulletproof armor circuits that I have hockey players go through during the end season. Now at the end season you got to incorporate a lot of active recovery work because where the off season is about physical development, the end season is about physical expression. Development, we can go hard with volume, intensity, and frequency because we are creating strong stimuli towards things like strength, muscle development, power development, you name it, we're going hard to create rapid changes in the body. But in the end season, you do have to dial back the intensity, frequency, and volume at which you apply in your dry land training because now the goal has shifted from development to expression. Expression representing total body performance. Total body performance never happens without total body recovery. So when you are in off season, you're typically gonna do four to six hard training sessions per week. Whereas in the in season, you're probably gonna do one to two hard sessions per week combined with three to four active recovery sessions per week. That is the ideal setup of a proper in-season training program and why it's so different programming from off-season to in-season and why you should never use your off-season tra training program during the in-season. It will without a doubt not lead to any of the results that you expect to see out in the ice. The Bulletproof Armor Circuit is an active recovery circuit that I have hockey players go through to increase their athletic potential and also prevent injury. How do I accomplish both of these at the exact same time? Well, I borrow a methodology that was originated from a physiotherapist named Gray Cook. He looks at the body as a stack of joints and it's beautiful in its simplicity. You're looking at seven stacks of joints which are going to make up the seven exercise circuit. We are looking at ankles, knees, hips, lumbar spine, thoracic spine, scapula, shoulder girdle. When you've got those seven set up and then you identify the needs of each joint, you can identify the exercise selection at which you're gonna apply in the circuit. What are the needs of each joint? Ankles, mobility, knee, stability, hips, mobility, lumbar spine, stability, thoracic spine, mobility, scapula, stability, shoulder girdle, mobility. If you're paying close attention, you're actually alternating the needs and requirements for each joint as you move your way up the kinetic chain. Ankle mobility, knee stability, hip mobility, lumbar spine stability. It just alternates and it makes a lot of sense because that's how the body moves in the most efficient way possible. But if we have a dysfunction at any point in this kinetic chain, it will completely throw off your movement mechanics. And when you throw off your movement mechanics, you throw off the two goals of the circuit, injury prevention and athletic potential. How does it throw it off? Well, let's use the ankles as a quick example, okay? If the ankles, their primary joint, like the ankle, you can move it in a full circle, up and down, laterally, inversion, eversion, the joint is capable of a ton of movement compared to the knee. The knee, kind of like the elbow, right? It's literally a door hinge. It's not doing big rotations. It's not twisting and turning. It's doing none of that. It is a door hinge. But the body is the ultimate compensation machine. So if you lack mobility in the ankle, your knee has to make up for some of that mobility to try and drive a compensated version of function. The problem with that is the knee is designed for stability. It is a door hinge, whereas the ankle is designed for mobility. So if the ankle lacks mobility, you're asking the knee to do a job that it's not designed for. You're asking the knee to give some mobility in movement to make up for where the ankle is lacking. What happens to the knee when you force it to try and be mobile? it starts to hurt. <laughs> You're going to gain inflammation over time. By the way, this doesn't happen overnight. You may be okay for a certain period of time, but then as time goes on and as inflammation slowly builds up in the knee, now you've got a sore knee. And what are you going to do? You're going to Google knee exercises, knee stabilization, knee this, knee that. Here's a big problem. Where pain flows in the body is very rarely the root cause. The root cause is somewhere else and it flowed pain elsewhere. 
So a pain in the knee was merely a symptom of a lack of mobility within the ankle. You're here doing all the knee protocols you've ever seen online, and yet your knee continues to hurt. And what do you say? Oh, I've just got weak knees. Oh, my genetics suck. Oh, I just can't. Wrong. You're just asking the wrong question. You're saying, what can I do to fix my knee? You should be asking, what can I do to fix my ankle? But that kinetic chain continues to go up because now that the knee is more mobile, what's going to happen up the kinetic chain? Well, the hip was supposed to be mobile. And now, since the knee is lacking stability and trying to be more mobile, well, now the hip, which is supposed to be a mobility joint, is gonna try and provide extra stability for the knee. So now, the hip isn't accessing its full range of motion of mobility, which would otherwise improve your stride frequency and edge work out in the ice. It's preventing its own mobility to try and provide stability. But now, since it's preventing its own mobility, what happens to the lumbar spine? The lumbar spine is supposed to be a joint of stability, yet now it has to open up and provide some mobility for the lack in mobility in the hip. What happens when you ask the lumbar spine to be mobile? Lumbar spine is like a tree trunk. It does not move at all. There's no rotation happening in the lumbar spine. So when you ask it to rotate and provide mobility to make up for the lack in the hips, you get low back pain. What do you do? You look for low back protocols to fix this problem, but you're asking the wrong question. Your low back is fine. It's trying to make up for the problem in the hip. The hip's fine because it's trying to make up for the problem in the knee, and the knee was fine because it's trying to make up for the problem that originated in the ankle. If you have an issue anywhere in your kinetic chain, you're going to run into a rippling effect. And that example could keep going all the way up to the shoulder girdle. I just discontinued it because I felt that I made my point. What happens now? Well, now I basically articulated how the kinetic chain can create inflammation and definitely injury over time if you don't give each joint what it needs for optimal function. But dysfunctional movement leads to a lack in athletic potential. So when we do a bulletproof circuit, we're giving each joint exactly what it needs for optimal function so that the kinetic chain can move the way in which it's supposed to without any joints trying to compensate for the lack of efficiency in other joints. But now that the kinetic chain is moving freely and efficiently, you're gonna be more efficient out in the ice and therefore your movement quality is gonna enhance and your conditioning is gonna enhance because you're simply more efficient and fluid with your movement. Hence, we decrease injury by giving each joint what it, want, what it wants, but as a byproduct of increasing the efficiency of each joint structure, we're now increasing our athletic potential because we have no issues causing dysfunction or compensations in our athletic movement patterns out in the ice. Got it? That is why we do the bulletproof armor circuit. So there's a mountain of evidence here in both strength and conditioning and uh, physiotherapy, but in application, it's quite simple. We're gonna do exactly what I said in the order I said it in. We're gonna do ankle mobility, knee stability, hip mobility, lower back stability, our thoracic mobility, our scapula stability, and ultimately our shoulder girdle mobility. Done. How are we gonna do it? We're going to do it at an active recovery pace. This is not a workout, it's not the point, okay? So what are you gonna do? You're gonna do not many reps. Reps, we're moving, we're looking at technical quality rather than rep quantity here. This is active recovery. We don't want to carry any residual fatigue with us out in the ice that would otherwise dampen our performance. So we're going to do five reps of each movement pattern. And for specific stability movements, such as prisoner squat holds for knee stability, 30 seconds, Superman hold for lumbar back stability. We'll do 30 seconds, very manageable time, as well as five reps, which is very manageable. You can move through it almost at a cool down type of pace, 50, 60% going for optimal quality. And then what would you do when you're finished here? Rest 60 seconds, repeat for three more rounds and you are done. That's a wrap, okay? Pick an exercise 
for each joint structure and you will massively prevent your injury risk out in the ice and you will dramatically improve your athletic potential for the purpose that's uh, the, the same reason that you're preventing injury risk. You're eliminating dysfunction. And when you have no dysfunction, you have optimal performance. And since it's in season, we are going to do it at an active recovery pace because our other training sessions are already checking the boxes for functional strength, hypertrophy, power, power endurance, conditioning, and all the rest. All right, bulletproof armor circuit. I recommend this be performed at least once per week, every single week during the in season. Use it and you will not regret it, all right? Thanks so much for watching. As always, if you learned anything or if you found this useful, make sure you hit the thumbs up button, subscribe to the Hockey Science Unleashed channel, and always let me know what questions you guys have in the comments sections because I'm gonna make future videos for you so that I'm always helping you become a better hockey player. Let's go.